Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Physical Therapy Private Practice Secrets of the Top 10%. My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm your host. And this week, we have another guest on our show. And this is Stephen from Limber Health. Limber Health, right, Stephen? You got it. I didn't want to say the wrong second word because I know everybody's got a particular there. And Limber Health has been a uh, business associate of ours, and we've been working together these guys have been great. The founder, Mark, is fantastic, brilliant. They've done all the heavy lifting that everybody else is following in the remote therapeutic monitoring space. So I'm going to let Stephen just kind of introduce himself. He is also a physical therapist, which I think you guys all know and like. Um, we like being PTs, helping PTs around here. And that is what he is doing. And that's why he's here on our podcast. Anything that we can do here at Meg that's going to allow you to live the life you've always envisioned for yourself or advance the profession of physical therapy is what you're going to find here with us. So um, this does both, honestly. And I will just turn it over to Steven and let him tell you a little bit about his past. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I appreciate it. And couldn't be more excited um, to, to be able to speak to you and, and everybody, um, you know, who, who listens to what you put out there. And that kind of goes back to PTs helping PT. So I'll, I'll take a roundabout way to, to hopefully tie that back in, given my, my background. So like you said, I'm a PT, I'm actually athletic trainer, but by background prior to that, went to PT school at Northwestern. Uh, thought that's what I kind of wanted to do, work with the, uh, you know, a- athletic population and um, took a, a job right out of school that I thought was going to be a, a really nice, unique situation um, where I could see that population. It was for one of those larger uh, kind of enterprise corporate groups and um, realized pretty quickly that wasn't wasn't where I wanted to be. Uh, and then I spent the rest of my clinical clinical career in, in small private practices, uh, mostly in the Chicago area where I'm from. Spent a couple of years living out in Colorado, but mom and pop shops um, from from there on out until I actually applied um, to a, a clinical role uh, with the medical supply company. So I was kind of looking for a little bit more opportunity for growth um, than, than where I was, and, and frankly, maybe a little too risk averse to start my own practice. And that's why I appreciate so much what you're doing and, and people like you are doing to you know, maybe if I had some of this back then, maybe I would have considered that 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 route a little bit more, right? Um, to have somebody with that support. And so, anyways, applied to that that clinical role, interviewed with that company, and found out the role had already been filled. But they liked me well enough that they asked if I would consider a, a sales role, which I never ever would have even thought to apply for or, or pursue. And yeah, you know, kind of just went for it, gave it a shot. Uh, figured to get my foot in the door, get a new experience, uh, and it wound up working out pretty well for me. So and I spent three years. Um, with this company selling mostly therapy supplies and equipment, managing a team of, of folks under me until I was uh, contacted by Mark, actually, who you referenced, one of our, our Limber co-founders. He started the company with his brother, Michael, who's our CEO. Mark functions as our CMO. Mark reached out um, to, to gauge, you know, kind of my interest in, in coming on board. And I was immediately into the mission. So that, that took no, no convincing of, of any kind. And I'm sure we'll get into that hear a little bit more. Uh, and ultimately, it, it wasn't an easy choice because I had a pretty good situation, but that's why I decided to, to make the jump, come on over to Limber. Um, and it's going back to that PTs helping PTs, just, just a better opportunity for me to have a more significant impact on the profession, specifically with private practices. as you know, so many challenges that, that practice owners are dealing with. And this is an opportunity to provide a little bit of relief or, you know, or something um, positive. And so really excited to be getting the word out. Yeah. And I can understand that. I, I think there's some value in doing sales for products, you know, getting people the tools and products they need to best succeed in private practice for sure. But I think there's just something, at least in my mind, in my, my head, my heart, there's something different about providing services to another, providing help to another person in a, in a way that enables them to live a better life, right? The tools just make the job a little easier, but the stuff that we're talking about here actually helps to um, improve the quality of life for all team members, including the owner in the practice and people in the community. So it's just a little bit more far reaching. So I can see your reasoning for making that switch. How long have you been with Limber Health now? Um, it was It was early... August, so about nine, nine months, nine, 10 nine months. months. Okay, mm-hmm. good. So you're, you're just cranking along there. You know, we ran into each other at PPS, which was always good fun catching up with you and Mark. And, and I think Mike was even there. Um, so that's all really good. Look, um, 
for those of you listening who are already med clients, you're already here on our platform. You're a member, you have unlimited coaching, you have 24 seven Slack channel support. You have access to all of our services, our billing services, our credentialing services, our virtual front desk services, our remote marketing services. So remote therapeutic monitoring falls in line with our wheelhouse of services that we actually provide. And so I think you should, if you haven't, or you're not doing it yet, don't be scared. Don't be worried. Let's, let's talk it through. Um, you're going to be of one nature or another. If you've been listening to my podcast, I have Vikram on here um, not too long ago talking about remote therapeutic monitoring as well. And he tends to target the do-it-yourselfer kind of public, uh, people who really DIYers. And uh, for sure, chat with him and, and see what his what his services are and his offering is. But you should chat with Stephen. You should chat with these guys at Limber Health because they're going to be more of that boutique full service provider if you're more of that nature like, woof. So let's start off with assuming um, the people listening right now don't know anything about remote therapeutic monitoring. Tell us what is remote therapeutic monitoring and then tell us from the therapist perspective, why would I want this in my clinic? So first, what is it? And then in order for me to bring about change, I either have to have a problem I'm solving or I have to have a benefit I'm gaining, like something that I didn't know about. This is probably a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think maybe the um, best way to answer that is using a, a little bit of, of numbers and, and some anecdotes. And so Mark, who we mentioned, it, it was actually very integral in getting these CPT codes for RTM that we'll, that we'll talk about created. Um, so we've actually had a company since 2019, even though, um, you know, RTM CPT codes weren't reimbursable until the beginning of 2022. And so uh, he actually played a part in getting these, these codes approved. And really that goes back to a few kind of problems, right? So some, some research out there shows 80% of a patient's outcomes are determined outside their clinic, right? Outside their clinic visits, which makes sense, right? Even if you're seeing them twice a week for an hour, whatever it is, 95% of their week, they're, they're not with you in the clinic, right? And maybe the most depressing uh, statistic that, that we utilize sometimes too is that 80% of information kind of goes in one ear out the other. Something you tell a patient during their visit, 80% of it, they, they don't retain. And so we think we do this great job with patient education. And a lot of times we really do, um, but it's not all just, just living in there, right? When they walk out the door. And so that results in less than 35% of people sticking to their prescribed HEPs. And so we as therapists do a great job. We know how important these activities are outside the clinic, but we also know that people aren't doing them, you know, a lot of the time and, and that they would benefit if they did. And so what further, you know, last number I'll throw at you that we've seen in a more positive, optimistic note is that patients that receive regular communication, regular check-ins are like over 90% more likely to adhere to that prescribed HEP. And so that kind of sums up you know, we just need to be able to check in with patients. So how do we do that? So we need something that's going to improve outcomes. It's not going to work if it's not a good patient experience. It's not going to work if we don't tie some kind of revenue or reimbursement to it, right? That's got, you got to incentivize providers to kind of give this a shot, try something new, dedicate resources to it. And so that's kind of the reason that these RTM codes were created in the first place. And so what it really refers to is this family of CPT codes, there's four of them that, that we utilize, that enable you to get reimbursed for monitoring patients between their visits in the clinic. So this is going on during an active episode of care, right? And they, they have to actually have a PT visit, a therapy visit, at least once every 30 days during it. So sometimes that's a, a misconception. People think this is something after they're done with PT. This is concurrent. So this is very much set up to complement what's being done in the practice. This is not telehealth. These are not therapy visits. It's purely supporting, coaching, motivating, making sure people are, are doing their exercises, making sure they're engaged with their plan of care, answering questions, all those things um, are, are considered RTM. And so what we've seen so far, um, which kind of makes sense is, and, and this goes to your question, Brian, about, you know, why would a practice owner want to consider this? Um, increased, you know, in addition to increased reimbursement, right? And we can dive into that deeper if you want. But in addition to that, we're seeing increased arrival rates decreased cancellation rates, decreased drop-off rates, right? All this stuff that people are just more invested in their plan of care. They're more engaged. And so they're less likely to drop off after three visits. And so what's one more thing that's kind of interesting there that I like to talk about is we actually don't see a huge change in total number of, of visits. Sometimes that's a concern for practice owners, right? It's like, well, that's great. Um, 
that they're having people check in with them, but does that mean I'm not going to have as many visits, you know, in the clinic? And so what we've seen so far is that stays about the same. And that's because people are getting better faster. So Mr. Jones might go from 12 visits to 10 visits, but Mrs. Smith is going from three visits to 10 visits, which is making up for that. And so it's a better patient experience. People are getting better faster. Um, and that's, you know, so far so good. That's, that was why these were set up and that's what we're seeing thus far. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. It comes down to the basic law of psychology, right? The more communication you have with somebody, typically the more affinity you share, you know, which is definition of likability of one another, you know, the more you, you like each other. People you don't like very often, you're not talking to, you know, you're just not having <laughs> yep. that conversation. So if you want to increase that patient care experience, you want to increase that patient engagement in your practice and, and as well as with your staff, then you need to infuse more communication, more engagement. So I love this on that premise alone. Um, our company has 90 employees. We work in 30 different states. We do nearly 200 different offices that we do billing for. And we make it part of our contractual agreements, whether we're doing virtual front desk or we're, whether we're doing billing, that the owner must, must, must per our contract agreement, come off the bus of production and meet with their team leader in billing or in virtual front desk once a month, if not more, but a minimum of once a month. Because we know when we're engaged and we're talking and we're swapping thoughts, ideas, shares, problems, solutions, the whole environment goes better. The whole operation gets better. There's no ill will, bad thoughts. There's no, oh, I can't get a hold of it. It's just, hey, we're collaborating together. So you guys really pride yourself on, on pushing the collaboration. I know you guys have a lot of engagement. Um, when I sign up with you for RTM and I say, you know what, I need to add this to my clinic. What is the decision that people, what is the factor that people are most telling you is making their decision for signing up with you and doing RTM with you? Making them say, say yes, or making them, you know, hesitate. Yeah. Is it, is it, do you get the sense that people are signing up with you? Let me reword the question. Do you get the sense people are signing up with you for RTM because it's an increased revenue stream to their practice? And there's nothing wrong with that. Trust me. I mean, we are suffering the income squeeze all over the place. Anytime you can squeeze a nickel out of something, you should. So is it because it's an additional income stream, income vertical for them? Is it because it's a better compliance tool for their patients? Is it because it's a better skill development um, um, process for their therapist? Are they saying, hey, I want to do RTM because it's better for my therapist. Or I want to do RTM because it's better for my patients. Or I want to do RTM because it's better for the practice financially. What do you think is the main leading motivator for people to pull the trigger and sign up? Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly it's, it's every one of those things, right? Depending on the, the owner, depending on who's running the practice. I would say if I could pick you know, a couple, the... Pick one. Would be revenue. Pick one. Revenue. Yeah, right. pick one. Revenue. I would say that too. I just want to be honest with our listeners because most of our listeners are either clinical directors or owners, mostly owners, or a lot of people want to go into startup. Look, guys, I want that to be the truth. If it is the truth, and I think Stephen told the truth, he's like, hey, honestly, people are approaching us because they see this as a new income vertical, right? This is going to add more revenue to the bottom line. In addition to the benefits to the patient, benefits to the practice, benefits to the therapist, of course. But if I can add an increased revenue stream to my practice and offset this income squeeze, it is not greedy to do that. It is just good business. It is good business because I'm helping more people and I'm having a greater engagement when doing so. So I wanted to say that because there's a little bit of a culture out there where money is bad. And I'm like, what? You spend one third of your life asleep. You spend one third of your life doing work for financial security and stability. And the reason why you want to sleep well in that first third, and the reason why you want to have a good career in that second third is because those two fuel the third third of your lifetime, which is friends, family, and recreation, which is where most people want to spend their time is friends, family, and recreation. So anything you can do to help strengthen the other two thirds of your life are going to help you enjoy your life even better with friends, family, and recreation, things you like to do. So I see you guys as really helping people have more actual work-life balance, even as an owner, people tend to think work-life balance is only for employees, but actually as an owner. So they pull the trigger. They're like, you know what? This is going to bring some money to the bottom line. On average, a 2000 square foot office with three therapists, five staff, what are they talking in terms of just rough income numbers on something like RTM doing 150 visits a week? Yeah. 
rough. I'm nailing you down here, but I am looking for that because people want to know, you know, and you can lowball it a little and say, at least you're going to do something like this, but you'll probably do more. Yeah, of course, it, it you know, I got to throw out there and you know, it, it varies. It varies by patient population, insurance type and coverage and all that. I would say if you're yeah, looking for, to, yeah, if you're looking to, to tie it to a number, um, I would say you can look for over $100 in profit. Uh, you know, there's different systems, right? So the way we set it up, which we can get into more if, if you like, um, we're, we're looking for a next, lot yeah. of patient engagement, right? And that mm-hmm. that would likely result in over $100 in profit per patient episode when they become an engaged limber patient. I know it's not exactly how you asked me to answer that, but hopefully that helps, right? People can just- What's an episode? Of, What's an episode? Episode of care. So throughout their normal episode of care, right? Maybe you're seeing them for eight weeks. 10 weeks, okay. whatever it is. Start normal. to finish. That's what you mean. Church, traditional definition of episode. I just want to clarify. Yeah, that yeah, for yeah. Everybody. Thank you for asking. So an episode of care, my, my eval to my discharge. And when I add RTM to that, I'm going to walk away with hundred dollars more. Now you can multiply that out by the number of new patients you get and the number of patient care you do in, in a yearly basis. So that gives a good rule of thumb. And that's because you guys are doing a lot of the heavy lifting and you're doing a lot for us. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, pretty, so talk about that. Let's talk about that. So what do you do? So I sign up, I'm, I'm all in. What do you do next? How does the rollout go? Tell me how this works. How do you set me up? Yeah, great question. And we are very much the white glove option. You know, we take a very high touch approach from start to finish. And so when yeah. somebody agrees to, to work with us, it starts with a kickoff call with our implementation team uh, and our client success team. And that's where we lay out the ground rules of, all right, how are we going to set this up? When are we going to do training? Because we're providing training to all their staff, clinical staff, admin staff, billing staff. We're providing all of that. When are we going to do the training? When are we going to go live? And then we're meeting with them weekly to, you know, even after we roll out and go live, right? So we're not just selling a software. We, we don't just give them software and kind of walk away. We're, we're establishing, I think you use the word collaboration, collaborative partnerships is what we're looking for. And so we're meeting regularly, even after to ensure their success um, with the use of this. And, and there's a couple of reasons we do that. Number one, that's just, that's what's right. Um, but one thing I haven't said yet is we actually take an approach where we provide the staff to do the monitoring. So going back to that white glove, we want the workflow in the clinic to have to change as little as possible. So your therapists are able to keep doing things the same way they do it today. They create the plan of care. They create the HEP. Obviously, any interventions in the clinic, that's on on the therapist. But we set it up in a way that they're assigned a care navigator is the term we use. And these are Mm -hmm. mostly licensed PTAs. They're all licensed therapy professionals, mostly PTAs. And that, but we, that clinic knows exactly who their care navigator is. So this care navigator becomes part of their team. It's not, hey, someone from Limber should reach out. The therapist is able to enroll somebody and say, hey, Stephanie's going to be reaching out to you within 24 hours. She's awesome. You're going to love working with Stephanie. She's going to help support you in your home program. And then that care navigator is purely, like I said, that that RTM role, right? So it's monitoring, supporting, mm-hmm. coaching, motivating. It's not changing plan of care. It's not changing the HEP. This is not uh, a, a therapist's role, right? It's therapy professionals, but functioning as a care navigator so that the therapist in the clinic is still in complete control of the plan of care. They see insight into every single bit of communication that we have. And this care navigator really becomes part of that team, uh, you know, of that of that clinic. And is that then, care navigator, I'm sorry to interrupt, is that care navigator no, a licensed clinician, either licensed PT clinician. or PTA? PTA either PT or PTA, yep. So most okay. states, it's a PTA. There's some, we are very, very cautious to be as compliant as possible. So when there's any doubt, we'll kind of err on the side of caution, use a PT as our care navigator. But sure. most states we're utilizing a, a PTA. Okay. Um, but then going to kind of tying that into our whole high touch white glove approach, what I'm trying to get to is saying that even our financial model, you know, how, how Limber makes money is tied to very similar um, milestones to the, to these RTM codes. And so basically we're incentivized for this to go well for the client because they're not going to be paying us unless they're going to be hitting units to where they can get reimbursed. And so, so you guys kind of share the journey financially completely. Gotcha. So you're as motivated to see it go right as they are. You got it. Yeah. So there's that's, no, that's, you're getting paid. It's not like you're getting paid whether they do well or not. That's not the situation. Right. So, and, and, two reasons that's important that you can already Mm -hmm. probably see, right? Number one is there's no way for a PT group to lose their shirt on this, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's very low risk um, commitment, but then also 
we're in there every step of the way to ensure success with it because their success is our success. Right. I love it. I love it. Um, how long is that rollout period to implement on board a, a new clinic? Good question. It depends a lot uh, on really two things. Number one, on the clinic side, how large are they? How many therapists do they have? How quickly can we get all those therapists on a training? Because we mm -hmm. like to have at least an hour of their time, which you know is, is a lot easier said than done to, to block schedules and whatnot. And then it depends on our care navigator situation because we're never going to let our care navigators get beyond a certain number of patients on their caseload. And so yeah. even if we have some established care navigators in that state, we may be hiring a new one um, for this new company that we're bringing on, right? And so if we have to hire one, sometimes that takes a little longer. But I would say if, if I had to give you a number um, or a range, usually we're getting going from, from agreeing to, to terms and yeah, let's do this together. We're usually going live within like three to six weeks. Okay, good. Good. So about a month. So it's about a month to go live, maybe a little longer, depending on the size of the office. That's really good. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, what do the staff members think about it? Forget about the owner. What do the staff members think? Like, yeah. do they, are they on board? Do they understand it? Do they, are they, are they triggered by it? Or are they like, Oh, one more thing to deal with? I think the way it's introduced to staff members is one of the most important things and provider engagement, therapist engagement is, is mm -hmm. our largest challenge and therefore our top priority. Gotcha. Everything we set up is with that in mind. So we can't make extra clicks for them to enroll patients, right? We can't make right. extra work. And that's why we're trying to take as much off their plate as possible. But don't get me wrong. This is a collaboration, right? This None of this happens if the therapists aren't enrolling appropriate patients um, into RTM so that our care navigator can then reach out. And so we make it as simple as possible for them with providing literature. And how, you know, we even during that training, we're going over the language of how should you introduce this to your patients, things like that. Mm. But to answer your question a little better, as far as first instincts, um, it's, it's a mix, right? Some patients or some therapists, I should say, who are more of that, that innovative mindset. They're like, yeah, we know digital technology is, is coming. We got to embrace it. This hybrid approach sounds like a promising thing hey, this is going to be less work for me because we're going to have somebody kind of handle that communication between visits that I may already be spending my time doing. This, this patient's texting me, they're emailing me. Now I have somebody to take that off my plate uh, a little bit. And then there's others who are skeptical about any kind of change. Um, and so the, the, the two biggest challenges probably are just change in general, asking them to do something different. And then, um, you know, the other being just that... Um, you know, it's, uh, they don't necessarily want, they're hesitant about another therapy professional in their plan of care, right? And so we have to be very clear with that messaging of this is your plan of care. This is your patient. We are just monitoring and we're going to provide more insight. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to know you haven't seen this patient in a month, in a week. You're going to know exactly how their pain has been every single day since in that you know, week since you last saw I'm sorry to interrupt you, Stephen, but that's no, funny. I'm done. And it's funny that you have to deal with that. I, you know, I was just doing interviews with, I'm doing interviews with all my staff right now, just one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the staff members said to me this morning, one of the things I love about working here at Meg is that you absolutely don't micromanage. Like there's zero micromanaging here. If you want to be a biller here and you get your hours done in four days, you're done. If you want to take off a Wednesday, nothing falls and you want to make up for the work on a Sunday, you can do that here. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, more people working in the same direction, the better. And so I look at this RTM and if I was a clinician, I'd be like, bring it on, man. Bring, you're going to bring somebody else in who's going to help me with my patients, get better execution, better compliance, better, you know, outcomes, you know, better communication. Do it. Like I'm one dude. I can only be in one place at a time. Like I, I you know, I, I tend to look at things from the lens of, whatever I'm doing at the time, I want to do it 110%. You know, I want to just go all in, but I can't be everywhere. Right. You know, I mean, as you know, leading in this podcast, I'm being like a little it technician, fixing my microphone, adjusting my <laughs> lights and setting up my cameras. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you know, at the time I'm all in, in, involved in that, you know, apologizing to you while you're sitting on the screen, but, but then when the podcast fires up and here we are, then this is all that's on my mind. Like, this is all that I care about right now. This is the only thing I'm thinking. So I'm thinking in the clinic, if you have therapists that have that embrace that kind of philosophy, having your full service, full care rollout implementation team, you know, care navigator support and might practice would be like heaven for someone like me. I mean, that's just my viewpoint on it. So 
but maybe I'm missing something. Let me ask you about this. So I have the right attitude. Like you said, staff, it's a mix, right? Some staff get a little nervous about, oh, I'm going to lose some autonomy. Someone's going to be in the middle between my patient and me and my care. And I think that's a fearful kind of approach. I don't, I, I wouldn't like to have therapists working for me that are so fearful. I think people should trust in the delegation and cooperation and collaboration of working with other licensed professionals and not worry about that. But that's just me. I don't know what you think. What do you guys think? You guys are listeners. I, I just feel a little differently about that professionally. But moving past that, let's say that's done. We pulled the trigger. What is the workload that actually falls on the average clinician under your model? What would you say that is to me as a, as a licensed therapist, not as an owner? We'll talk about the workload on the owner next, but let's talk about the workload on the staff therapist. Yep. And, and as you can imagine, just about every owner is very conscious of the workload on their staff, right? And so that's, that's always an important point. I, I hope they are. Yeah, um, I can imagine. And so it, it, it's not much. Um, it comes down to taking the 30 seconds to introduce this to your patient, right? And why right. they should consider it, why they should respond when that care navigator reaches out. Just the fact that the care navigator is going to be reaching out so that they're not caught off guard when they do. All right, let's we, stop there. Let's stop yeah. there for one second. Let's role play that. I wanna role play that. You're the therapist, you're the care nav, you're, you're the therapist, you're talking to me as your patient. I am your, you know, 69 year old, you know, total hip, you know, revision patient who's done well, but I need, you know, prolonged care at home. So break it to me, break it to me. How, how, how would that sound? I'm putting you on the spot here. I know, but you're a therapist and, and you're coaching other therapists on how to roll this out to their patients. So roll it out to me. All right, Steven. So you want to talk to me about this thing I'm supposed to do at home? What, what are we, what are we, what are we looking at? Yeah. So we use this really cool new program. It's, it's, it's really innovative. It's called Limber. Um, and really, it's just we're actually going to provide a, a therapy, a, a PTA, where is a care navigator who's going to be checking in with you, um, just to answer any questions you have, making sure that you're you're doing well with the exercises that we just went over, um, and so that we can make sure you're sticking with your plan of care, and that she can answer any basic questions you have, and you're really going to like her. She's great. She's helped a ton of my patients show, so far. So is this yeah. is this girl somebody I know? Is she here in your office? She's not here in our office, but she is part of our team here um, and she works remotely and she does this for a lot of our patients. And we've heard some really, really good things about the relationships that they've had with her. And um, I think it's going to be really, really good for you. So how does she know me? How does she know what I'm going through? I mean, I know you and, you know, we've been together now for over a month and a half and, and I'm not opposed to talking to her, but is she going to know stuff about me? Yeah, absolutely. So we talk all the time. So she's going to see everything that I write in, in our note from our, our visit today and the visits that we've had. And then she's going to let me know too what you guys talk about. She's going to let me know how you've been doing with your exercise program. If you're running into something where you're having some pain with an activity, she's going to let me know about that. Um, and so it's going to provide some extra insight for me too. And so that way, when you come back in and we see you next time, I'm going to know exactly what's going on and we can kind of get right into it and, and progress your plan of care to get you better as, as fast as we can. All right. Well, my son said I shouldn't give out any social security information or credit card data or DNA strands. So I'm going to not share any of that with this person. I'm sure she's not going to ask me that, right? That's no problem at all. There won't be any, any, any personal information they need to share. We just do need you to download this app, which we'll help you with. And then she'll be reaching out to you. Yeah, I've got an iPhone 14 Pro. I really like my iPhone. So we can do that. So if I understand, you're basically just bringing in another team member. And now there's two of you working with me, one of you working with me at home and one of you here for my visits. Is that correct? That's exactly right. It just helps us progress your plan of care appropriately when we can have somebody kind of be in our eyes and ears outside the clinic. And they don't need to talk to you all the time. They won't be bothering you if you don't want to be talking to them. But I would encourage you, um, to, to respond and, and let her know how you're doing. All right. All right. And how much does this cost me? Is this going to be costing me anything? I'm on a fixed budget. No, this is all going to be, I'll have to look, uh, check on, on your insurance, but uh, no, if you have your Medicare uh, patient, then I think you said you're 69 years old in this. I'm in this 69 scenario. on Medicare. Yep. I've worked oh, my no, whole life. I don't want to get be, another bill. You know, heating oil is expensive these days. Absolutely. It's worth asking. All right. Well, no, that sounds good. good. When should I expect her to call? 
she's going to reach out to you within within the next 24 hours. So she'll be she'll be calling you once I assign this home exercise program to you, you're going to get a, a text message and an email to help you download the app and access your exercises. And then she'll be calling you within the next 24 hours to, to set up a, a time to talk. All right, good. That sounds good. All right. So that's good. So, you know, you get some of those kind of questions. I'm just kind of being a little humorous, but um, you know, the, the, you're, you're talking elderly people and for the most part, now this is covered by commercial insurance. Yes. No, maybe, maybe. Yeah. So that's a, a very good question. Um, it is several commercial. I mean, we have like over 30 payers that are, are covering this, but of course with anything insurance, some are, are messier, stickier than others. Um, there's several that have positive policies. There's some that we've seen, EOBs where they're covering it, even though they don't have a written policy on it. And that's actually a big part. You know, we're really trying to lead that charge uh, and getting wider and wider acceptance of this. Of course, what we can prove out and show in terms of the patients that are already on it, right? The better outcomes we have, the better results we get, the easier that'll become. You know, Stephen, I got to start to interrupt you again, but I got to just comment on that. I think for people who are listening, I mean, you guys are at the forefront. I mean, you guys are the ones that brought the codes and got them approved. And you're the ones that are pushing the commercial carriers. I mean, you guys are really the leading force in this space. Um, not to say that you're the only ones doing it, but I, I really do applaud you. And I think we need to stop it here and just give you guys some credit for doing the heavy lifting. You know, a lot of people are going to benefit from your heavy lifting and you guys don't mind doing it because you're benefiting the profession and you're helping our public. So I do think you deserve credit for that. Um, it's always best to, you know, just give credit where credit's due. You guys are the originators of this kind of thing. In my book, in my mind, it, it feels like that to me. So the workload doesn't seem to be a problem with my staff. Um, staff members thinking about it. It's all about how you present it, which we've communicated here, I think, which is really good. Here's one thing that's come up. Um, so I, I hope the listeners have a picture of how this goes. It's very remote. It's very assistive and all that. Um, if this may be unfounded at all, but somebody asked me to ask, is this going to open my clinic up to more frequent audits and inspections? Because like you already answered about commercial care, some do, some don't, some have policies on it, some don't. They still, I have a billing company, trust me. It's it, these insurance companies, man. I mean, it's like, you know, play by the rules when it benefits them, but don't play by the rules when it doesn't benefit them. They can make their own rules whenever they want. So I'm not going to get started on my soapbox of billing, which is why I tell practices across America, you have no business doing billing. You never went to school for it. The rules, regulations, compliance standards a practice appeals, denials, rejections, wearing orange and black for doing one thing wrong, just innocently doing it wrong is just such a high risk. It's ridiculous that people even consider doing their own billing. I can actually do it with my professional staff, oftentimes for less money annually than what they can do themselves. And if not less, maybe a little bit more, but a much better service. So you're talking to the choir when you're talking about this billing dynamics and you guys are fighting the fight. But the question has been asked is, does this trigger my practice to be more in the limelight, more in the spotlight for potential audits? What are your great, thoughts on that? Do you have any info question. on that? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is, in my opinion, it this part's not opinion. It hasn't happened to our knowledge. It will happen is my, is my opinion, right? It's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, at some point. Mm -hmm. And so we, like I said before, are, are always erring on the side of caution when it comes, comes to compliance. Rick Owenda, who some of your listeners might, might be familiar with, he, he's an advisor, oh, who yeah. always works exclusively with us. We, we lean on him um, for, for things like this. But as far as the platform goes, we track literally to the second, every bit of communication that this care navigator has with the patient and it's all documented exactly what was discussed exactly what form of communication exactly how long it took that's how we come up with the number of, of units that are being billed right but that we keep it for years the the group you know that we're working with has access to that at all times in real time they can see and so if there ever is an audit down the road we'll be we're able to pull that and say here's exactly what happened that's what added up to these amount of, of units and that's why that's what was billed. And so I think you're safe. Not that anybody wants to get out of it or deal with that, but um, should be totally, totally safe if and when that happens. Well, I love that. I absolutely love that. Like, you know, people ask me stuff about audits. I'm like, look, man, you just got to be prepared for an audit at all times. You got to do the right thing all the time. You have to have everything documented, filed, sourced all the time. So that the conversation of should I be worried about an audit? The answer is no. 
Whether you get audited or not is not within your control. It will happen randomly. And if it does, just throw them to data and make them go away. It's not a problem. So I love that. I love that answer. I think that's a really great answer. Um, those are all my questions. I think this is something that people really have to experience for themselves, really have to contact you. Stephen, is there anything else you'd like to put out there that you didn't say that you wanted to say here? Because um, I want to get as much benefit out to my public as, as I possibly can. Um, but you've answered my questions. Yeah, no, I mean, I hope I hope this is clear. And you already kind of said it, but we're, we're with you in terms of we just want to advance the profession, right? Right we're pushing things towards a value-based care approach. And we think this is a step towards that, right? The, the whole point of the creation of these codes is trying to prove, and we are so far, that if you pay for just a little bit more, that's going to help ensure the success of conservative care, then you wind up not paying a lot more for unnecessary injections and imaging and surgeries, right? That's the what we're trying to kind of prove out here. And that's what we're progressing this towards. And so we just want to get the word out. Uh, so I really, really appreciate you having me on here to just talk about RTM in general and get practice owners considering this, whether it's with us or not. Obviously, we have a unique approach that we take. If that sounds interesting, obviously, we encourage people to, to reach out to us. But we understand we're not the right fit you know, for everybody, but we're happy to talk about it with anybody. Just yesterday, I literally yeah. referred somebody who reached out on our website to learn more. I called them. I explained why I thought they might not be the best fit. They kind of verified that. And I literally emailed them to the CEO of another company who does RTM. Um, you know, so, it's so funny for you to say that. That is fantastic. I, you know, uh, I did the same thing last week. Uh, last week I had two practice. Uh, well, there were two startup people. Um, one had already started. One's looking to start up. And they were talking to me about their startup. And, you know, I do a lot of startups. And both of them I discouraged. I said, you're not ready for Meg. You're not ready for what we have to offer you. You're not your mindset and like your hypothetical idea and impression of how this is going to go and your expectations haven't been well thought out. You need to build a performa. You need to build this. You need that. So I sent them over some stuff and I sent them on their way. You know, when people are in the business of helping people succeed in their business, not your business, I'm in the business of helping other people succeed in their business, their vision, their drive. They know that. They sense that. They trust you when you come across it, it, transparently and genuinely. And that's who you guys are. And I really like bonding to you guys. You know, I'm in the process of working through the um, ERTC, you know, the earned uh, revenue tax credit thing from, you know, from COVID, you know, those, those quarters and whatnot. And I'm going to do a podcast on that for you guys listening. You want to hear about a group, I'm going to bring this group on, but I'm not going to bring them on until they actually go through the whole process with me first and show me that they dot their I's and cross their T's. But I'll tell you right now, I am like over the moon with this group I'm working with, and I will be bringing that to you very, very soon. So you guys who are interested in submitting can actually get the revenue benefit there. And that's no different than this. You know, people will say, well, is that going to open us to more audits? Cause I'm getting this. If it does, then just have your ducks in a row. This group says the same thing. Steve says, we will stand behind. We will defend you. We will stand behind our application. We will keep all the copies, records, data, you know, when groups are willing to work with you and be Velcro to your shoulder and just carry the ball along with you, you got nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing to worry about. So vet your companies carefully, ask the right questions, everybody, know who you're partnering with and know that they have a proven track record of success and absolutely find out who they're running with because, you know, good people run in packs, right? So Stephen, thank you so much for your time. I'm very grateful for you coming on my podcast and sharing what you can with our public. Um, anything I can bring of value. I know you have many places to be and things to do and you're here with me. So I am very thankful and very grateful for your time. Thank you so much for having me on. And, and to the point of just getting the word out and talking about this, if anybody does want more information, talk to me or anybody else with our group, we set up a landing page just, just for you guys. So if they go to limberhealth.com, it's limber, L-I-M-B-E-R, like flexible, limberhealth.com slash Meg. Um, they can they can sign up for a demo or to, to get some more information from us. Perfect. Limberhealth.com slash Meg. And we're going to have all that in the notes below and the show notes and whatnot. So please, everybody, you know, click subscribe like this. We're not going to spam you. Get connected. These drop every single week, midweek, usually every Wednesday. Um, and I'm here to help you to live the life you've always envisioned as a therapist. So that's it, everybody. Until next episode, start each and every day expecting to do well.